Thank you, Chair. Um, this evening, we have Josh Lapp from Designing Local. He is the principal of our consulting for firm uh, who is working on the Arts and Culture Master Plan. He's going to be sharing some feedback with the committee tonight and requesting um, some additional feedback from you all. So feedback from the community thus far um, and then sharing some general concepts. And I will uh, turn it over to him to get us started. And I know he has a presentation for us, so I'll let him screen share and get that pulled up. Yes. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, this is, I'm just glad that I have met most of you because I can at least put voices to faces. So. Um, so I do have a little bit of a presentation for you. I am looking for this to be a conversation as much as it is sort of a one-way presentation. So um, do feel free to um, stop me, ask questions, give feedback, um, and we can kind of go from there. So um, I just want to first begin talking a little bit about an overview of the engagement that we've done thus far. Um, or do I need to do an introduction? I probably should do an introduction because I don't think all of you have met with me one on one. Um, uh, though you, I think you most, I think everyone has met with somebody from Designing Local. So um, my name is Josh. Um, I started Designing Local with my business partner, Amanda, about 10 years ago. Um, we do this type of arts and culture planning kind of all over the country and have for the past 10 years. Um, working on this project with our team, we have myself, um, Anna Tallarico, who is our public art coordinator, who has been um, working on policy things and other uh, work in the background as well. Um, Jasmine Metcalf, who is an urban planner with our team. You may have spoken with her one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and additionally, we have some other folks on our support team that are helping us out with various graphics and things like that, including our um, uh, intern from the University of Cincinnati, Andrew um, Ebley, and also uh, Gabrielle Smith, another urban planner on our team who's helping with graphics and other things. So um, going to that engagement overview, um, again, uh, I think most of you had stakeholder interviews one-on-one -on -one with either myself, uh, Anna, or Jasmine. And those, um, we had about 35, I think maybe a little bit more than that, but um, some of them, I didn't see like a final confirmation when I looked today, um, but we had at least 35 one-on-ones. And those were really, as we were starting this process and getting to know Vacaville, getting to know all of you individually, and really just trying to understand a little bit more about what folks in the community are looking for when it comes to arts and culture. And also, again, just to orient us with the community. Um, I also made a visit early in the project um, and Anna made another recent visit uh, ooh, only uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago um, to uh, discuss some um, of the things that she's been working on. In addition to those, we just wrapped up our survey uh, we had 103 survey responses and actually something that was really interesting when I, or kind of weird really, when I look today, um, this, I've never had this happen before, but we had 103 survey responses and we had 103 complete surveys, which means that every single person that opened up the survey to take it actually finished it. Um, which, like I said, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Usually it's like, uh, let's say two thirds of the people have completed the survey. So although that isn't a huge number of responses, I would say that means like we have a good quality of responses. And I think that'll be played out when I show you some of the results here in a moment. Um, we also, uh, we did the Weaving Our Future Community Art uh, Project, which I know you'll be hearing more about tonight. So I'm not going to go so deeply into that, um, but I'm happy to if um, we would like to, but Angela, the artist that we worked with, led six um, workshops with Mel and her team throughout the community, um, and she was uh, selected through an RFP process that we um, ran, and um, that I think was a really awesome way for us to get in and have um, collaborative uh, conversations with uh, individuals in the community, particularly kids. I think I have an image here. Um, of one of those workshops taking place 
So I know we had some really good attendance. I mean, it was there was a variety of a, attendance at various events. Um, but I think, um, and Mel can speak to this too. I think we had at least 80 at one of them. Um, am I saying that right, Mel? Um, and we had Not less at one. some, but yeah, we had some that were like super well attended. So it was really exciting. Yeah. Um, and then that culminated last weekend in, um, I think I'm also saying that right, in the performance of Carmen, or maybe two weekends ago. Um, my dates are a little up in the air. Um, but um, so that was a really awesome opportunity to work with a local artist, get some of that direct engagement, and that also fed in some, to some of the survey responses. So we actually just closed the survey um, on uh, Friday. So that was when we got our last responses. So, um, and I do want to give a little bit of uh, any questions before I go on to some of the survey responses. They're shaking heads now. You, so I, okay. Okay. Great. So we hearing none. Um, we'll go into some of the survey responses. So I'm not, again, there were a bunch of questions. I'm not going to go into all of them because we will have a stakeholder report or I'm sorry, an engagement report um, forthcoming that will detail all of the responses and really we'll have that as an appendix to the plan so folks can see what those responses were. Um, but I did want to go over a couple of them that I thought were really interesting. So one of the questions we asked are, which of these identi um, identities describes what motivates your decision to interact with arts and culture? So there was a series of these. I want to say there were sort of maybe nine. Um, I pulled out the top three because those were the ones that were over 70%. The rest, I think the next lowest one was 66%. Um, I thought these were really interesting. And, and honestly, this says a lot about what folks are looking for when it comes to arts and culture in Vacaville. Um, so to have fun was number one with 89% of people uh, responding uh, that that was one of their top ones. So uh, I think that's really awesome. Um, and I think that, again, talks about the type of arts and culture experiences we want to create in Vacaville. So having fun, yay, fun, that's great. Um, to support local, that's also really important for us to think about as we are um, enhancing the arts and culture program for the city to really think about what does it mean to support local and how can we um, help, you know, enhance the local arts ecosystem. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the third one was to relax, which I think is also another very interesting, I think it's sort of goes along with fun, right? Like um, those two things might be different, but um, they might have this sort of same um, thing that is encouraging both of them. So people are really looking for like an outlet when it comes to arts and culture. Um, I believe 66%, the next lowest one was to have a cultural experience. So that makes um, sense as well. But uh, I think that these all rose really high to the top. So this is a really interesting thing for us to look at when we are thinking about like, what does it look like to create, to craft um, an arts and culture program at the city? Um, also, what barriers exist to you participating in arts and culture activities in Vacaville? Okay, so there were, again, a number of these and I didn't have them all on here so that you would be able to read them. Um, the next lowest one was in the 20s. So these two were really a lot higher than pretty much all of the other ones that was like no contest, that lack of knowledge about offerings or where to find them. And then just generally the lack of offerings itself. Um, so that what is interesting to me is like people that are responding to the survey feel like they likely know that there are things happening, but they don't know where they're happening or where to find them. Um, so that's important to know. And then just lack of offerings in general. So again, these are, this is really important information. Um, and, you know, some of the other ones were like cost, transportation, other things. So it's interesting that folks don't really see those as barriers. And, um, you know, this is something that we've asked elsewhere and the responses are different. Um, so um, on some level, uh, impacting people's knowledge about the offerings and creating more offerings is easier than increasing people's tr access to transportation or, you know, um, the cost and other things. So I think this is, this is a really interesting one for us to look at. 
Um, I think this is the last one I have for you, but um, what cultural activities do you want more of in Vacaville? Um, so again, uh, these, I think these all, uh, th these were all the ones that were above 50%, the top four. So community arts events and programming, that does not surprise me. Live music, public art. Um, I think that's actually, um, you know, we had this really long list that included a bunch of things that people love. So it's really interesting to know that public art uh, and visual art, uh, which are kind of synonymous, but not always, um, are both in the top four above 50%. Um, so yeah, again, I just wanted to give you all a little bit of an overview as to what um, some folks said when it came to this. And we'll have, a, uh, like I said, we just closed this on Friday. So um, we haven't totally um, dove into all of, because some of those questions um, had open-ended responses, which we need to do more analysis of and things like that but we will be um, reporting out to you with this information at a later date. Um, and this is actually chiming in uh, for me to show you the stakeholder report too. Um, so if you'll bear with me for one second, um, we developed this uh, vision out of the stakeholder report. So the stakeholder report is a document that we're also gonna provide to you um, that is a culmination of all of our 35 stakeholder conversations, not in, and that is again, separate from an engagement report, which we'll also have that will be more focused on the public. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know, we wanted to pull this up and really just sort of ask if this rings true, right? That Vacaville is, uh, you know, if we create or when we create this um, enhanced arts and culture program for the city, that it's dedicated to presenting a wide variety of high quality cultural offer, cultural experiences and public art, collaborating with the community to enhance spaces for creativity and engagement and enriching the lives of everyone who calls Vacaville home. So that is the vision that we took away from our stakeholder conversations. Um, and just to give you, again, to give you a sense of that larger report, if you'll uh, bear with me for one minute while I pull it up. Um, you can see what that looks like here. I'm not going to go through it uh, because um, there are lots of things on here, <laughs> um, but we will send this over um, to you with uh, all this info that you can look at a little bit more closely along with the engagement report. Sorry, I'm going back to the other window. So give me a brief second because my computer didn't like to offer that. Here we go, okay. Back to the presentation here. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or feedback about this, the vision? I can't see you if you remember, so. Um, no, no one's speaking up yet, in. but I'm still Okay. <laughs> still, we're still digesting, Josh, still digesting. Okay, that's fine. You know, this is a big, this is kind of big, so uh, feel free to take time to digest and also, this is the kind of thing where we can take feedback um, individually from each of you, uh, either on follow-up stakeholder calls or uh, via email too, if that would be helpful individually. We do have one comment, Vice uh, Chair Bates. Yeah, please uh, go. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. So one thing I just noticed is in the, in the sculptural art category of things that people thought were lacking, that was 52% that was of the people thought that that was that was something that we were missing in Vacaville, and I feel like mm -hmm. you know, art and sculpture all over our city. And why do you think that why why do you think that that was even a, even an issue? I mean, you've been you've been here, you've seen a lot of the art. Why do you think that that was something that that was triggered? Um. Well, I would say that you uh, from a public art collect so obviously all over the country. There are tons of different communities your size. Some of them have no public art program at all. Some of them have very um, large scale public art programs that definitely dwarf um, Vacaville's. 
I would say that, um, it, again, I have, like, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to your question, but if I had to guess an answer to your question, it would be that you have other communities in your region or sort of in neighboring regions. So let's say the Bay Area or Napa, even Sacramento, which have um, more developed public art programs and have uh, more long-term public art funding. So although there is some sculpture and and there's um, a you know decent amount of um, artwork, uh, the I think there's room for more. And I also would say that the city, um, compared to other communities, is not funding or doesn't have a funding mechanism, which we'll talk about more here in a moment, but does not have the robust funding that other communities have. So that could be a reflection of that. And you, you know, I know that the Bay Area, for instance, lots of communities there have really long standing public art programs. And if I had to guess, uh, there are lots of folks moving to Vacaville from other communities in that region because of cost and other reasons. So um, I don't know. What do you, I don't know if you, that rings true or you have other thoughts. I don't know. I think that's, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, trying to make an interesting parallel between trying to compare Vacaville to a Berkeley where, you know, or a, or a neighboring city, you know, similar size and demographic. Uh, I just found it an interesting stat that was pulled from that, from it. Just wanted to talk about it for a minute. Yeah, I'll just go back to that. Um, I mean, you know, at the same time, that was one of several things, right? Um, it wasn't the top, but it's it's an interesting thing to think about. And I would say a lot of um, people's experience with public art, even in Vacaville, uh, might be about where they go and where they are frequently. So, you know, if you're in downtown, you're probably experiencing more public art than if you're in a newer subdivision that might have one piece or might have some cool play equipment, um, but doesn't necessarily have as much public art as you might find in the downtown area or in um, some of the parks. I think that these things that people want is also part of a marketing problem that, you know, they want more events and want more, you know, more media coverage of it, but we're not doing a good job of, or not, we're doing a good job, but we're not getting to the people, uh, the message that those events are happening. Or we're doing the same thing over and over again and it's not hitting the people the way that it needs to so the lack of offerings and the lack of marketing might be increase their knowledge of what public art we have if they knew that it was there and available for them absolutely and that's a common issue you know we hear we hear that pretty much everywhere we go in terms of lack of knowledge you know there's often more things happening than people have the time or capability of attending um, but, you know, we don't have, this is true in the arts world and this is true in other portions of society where it's not like, oh, we all get the same newspaper and therefore we all know all the events that are happening because we read about it in the same newspaper that everybody in the community gets, you know, there's not like that doesn't exist anymore. We have social media, we have the city, we have Visit Vacaville, we have lots of things and ways that people are finding out about information, but that is becomes difficult because we don't have kind of centralized marketing opportunities in the same way that we might have had in the past. So I, I think some of that just comes with the way that things work today, but that also means that we definitely need to step it up and find better ways to um, create that hub for people to come and find information at, whether it's about public art or else, you know, other things. Yeah, a couple points. Go for it. Um, actually, personally, to dovetail on uh, Brian's comment, some of this is, uh, would really be enhanced with lighting, better lighting. So like, you know, so that these sculptures and these pieces could be viewed at night. Uh, and, and I just feel like that feels really a city that people they get around in their cars, the city. So, you know, they don't always mm -hmm. share face with um, kind of smaller public art pieces or uh, they might not see the, the piece that's on the roadside that's been there forever. And 
certain corner, but maybe because it's not lit or because it hasn't been refreshed or whatnot, like it just, yeah, it just starts to blend into their everyday um, experience if they sort of miss what's in plain sight. So, um, yeah. Well, the Angelus thing this, this summer, we're lucky to have any pieces of, of artwork that came out of that because it was so freaking hot. <laughs> well, then there's the yeah, weather. Yeah, I mean, we're out, she was out four, four or eight times, like six, six times. I know. Right there. Six times, yep. Yeah. Right there in the bracket. Like, to even have any outcomes out of that, out of the impressive heat we've had over the summer, you know, sure. it's, yeah. we, have, we have great fall and great spring, but our summers are ridiculous. Yep. So that is going to affect the way, I mean, like, what struck me from the vision is this whole uh, concept that public art is tied to the space that it sits in, that it lives in. So, um, you know, when we think about the spaces and the public spaces and uh, that are accessible to large numbers of people, it's going to be downtown, it's going to be at our community centers, cultural arts centers, um, that libraries. the libraries. Okay. So, um, you know, if you're someone that doesn't really traverse those spaces on a regular basis, you might not, you know, engage with we don't have it. Yeah, exactly. Because they don't go there. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I mean, oh, the grocery store. Yeah, <laughs> I have a residency. I, I, I can't say I've inquired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just this idea that it's tied to space, I think, is definitely the space that it lives in and resides in is definitely a, a key point here. And so, understanding what the opportunities are for those spaces. And um, something that you just said that really, um, I don't think I'm going to address in this slideshow, but will be certainly something that we talk about in as we move forward, um, is when we're looking for opportunities for public art or other arts activities, um, this idea of creating opportunities that are not just, you know, your physical um, permanent sculpture in a median or a roundabout, which I absolutely love and think are great. Um, but, you know, even those types of things, which are awesome, still become part of the landscape and become, you know, over time, they're less, you know, you, you're not like wowed by it every day. And so creating um, temporary or programmatic opportunities um, for public art in particular or other sort of engaging things um, I think are really good opportunities for Vacaville because it will also create that incentive for people to come and experience it like when it's happening, um, given that it might be a short-term thing and maybe it's happening in the winter when it's a much better experience for people to come out and um, uh, interact with something. But there's really cool temporary stuff happening. Um, there's light um light installations that are happening which are oh, yeah. are actually really well positioned for somewhere like Vacaville because um I've noticed this like uh you have shorter you know we have shorter days in the winter and you guys actually have a place where people can go outside in the winter so that's nice um <laughs> uh so you know there's lots of cool things lighted things other interactive pieces and you're in a really good place um to be able to get some things probably at a lower cost as well. So good opportunities there. Love that, yep. So we'll be working on that. We'll have a whole series of ideas and things, but um, other things about the vision before I move on to our next topic. Hearing none, I'm gonna go, but I can always go back. Um, I want to talk a little bit just overall about um, our approach to improving what I'm calling arts infrastructure. Um, so this is a multi, a thing with multiple components. Um, you know, we've, again, I think we heard if I look just back in that survey where people are looking for more community arts offerings, they're looking for more public art, they're looking for more visual art, um, they're looking for more music but just generally more arts opportunities and lack of offerings was also something that we saw. Um, 
So, you know, we have to think about like, how can we address that? Um, and in order to do that, I think ultimately increased funding um, is something that's really important. And um, so if we're talking about increased funding, we certainly have a lot of precedents that we're going to be using like case studies to um, give recommendations for the city to do that. Um, and so that's something that we're going to be looking at. Um, and I can certainly talk more about that. But we also realize that f money itself doesn't actually solve the issue um, because with money and with more programming or more public art or um, other opportunities, that would also necessitate increased staffing, which may come along with that funding. Um, so let's say a funding mechanism is proposed as part of this planning process and is adopted by council. Um, some of that, uh, you know, a small portion of that funding mechanism may go towards uh, helping to support increased staffing um, to then go towards increased programming and public art, because, of course, anything that happens, you have to have people to do it. As you likely know, you know, anything that's happening with arts at the city right now is either Mel and her team or somebody else likely in the Parks and Rec team. Um, and again, with all of with those two things, I think would come for come um, a greater role for everyone sitting in in front of me, um, you know, uh, virtually. <laughs> um, and with that greater role could come, you know, some changes with how the Arts Advisory Committee or um, potentially, you know, changing the structure in a way that makes it more of an art commission or something to that effect, um, because there may be a lot more things to, to look at. So um, I know in other communities that have adopted uh, increased funding mechanisms, these things came along, uh, you know, not immediately afterwards, but soon after they have, you know, uh, some staffing needs in order to help implement public art and programming. And then you know, you all and other things that I might all talk about here in a moment that um, may become things that the uh, Arts Advisory Committee or if it were to transition to something like an Arts Commission would look at. Um, thoughts, questions before I go on? Great. Um, so kind of tying to back to this increased role and increased funding, like what are some of those possibilities? Um, so certainly more public art. I think that's a, um, a very straightforward um, outcome. So, and more um, large scale public art, temporary public art opportunities. There's really lots of opportunities in Vacaville and especially depending on how the funding mechanism is created, there, there might be some tie to how that happens. So um, a lot of funding mechanisms around the country that are focused on public art and or cultural amenities um, come from developers. And so sometimes those fees create opportunities for individual developers to do public art on their sites or to pay into some sort of fund. Um, so that's certainly something that we're going to be looking at. But even so, again, with that comes administration and other things. So tying it back to the last side slide. Um, that also could create um, support for, you know, or create funding opportunities for grant support, um, potentially for local artists or arts nonprofits. Um, you know, there have been a variety of ways in which the city is supporting um, arts nonprofits in particular um, with various programming, whether at VPAT or in other ways. So some of this is already happening, but this could be an opportunity for um, more support for something like that. And again, if you have a grant program um, that would then necessitate some sort of role for an arts commission um, or, you know, the arts advisory committee to have a greater role in helping to figure out how those grants are, are, um, are administered. Um, and same with public art. I think you're already doing that. You'll do that more tonight. Um, but again, there would be likely more things happening. So more work. Um, more um, necessity to do things. And then also just increased city arts focused programming. So um, Mel and her staff are already, you know, well underway in 
um, executing arts and culture programming, as you know, Creek Walk, uh, Dia de los Muertos, um, which I'll talk about here briefly in a moment, um, and other events. So the city's already doing some of this. And again, this could en help enhance that and create permanent funding streams for that. Questions, comments? Um, so the last thing I really wanna talk about, and I'm happy to take, again, take more questions or comments, but I did want to um, mention that we're looking at future engagement opportunities. So um, we intend to uh, have um, something at Dia de los Muertos. So we, if you didn't catch, um, we've been using that in our branding all year long. There's some really amazing photos from the event last year. Um, so we just thought it was only natural. That would be something where we come and pre we present um, kind of a more built out uh, version of what we've been talking about here to the public to ensure like what we're hearing and what we're what we heard in the survey what we heard um, in our stakeholder conversations and what we have uh, taken all that information and created we're hearing from folks that that is you know the correct like this is right everybody's saying yes we can go along with it and that gives us more um, push to move into kind of finalizing a plan and I know there's a multicultural arts event, event, I have events here, but event um, that is planned later in the year, or I'm sorry, in early 2025, that we were thinking, hmm, maybe that that's happening. Maybe that is a culmination um, event for us where we're maybe that's timed in a way that we can unveil the final plan. So just thinking about those two things, which are, I think, natural opportunities for us to do engagement um, in the future. So I think that's all I have for you. Other thoughts, questions, comments, things you wanna see that we didn't mention, um, things you wanna hear more about? Stop Go for it, we that. have a comment, yes. Uh, Please. I, I really like something you said about enhancing spaces for creativity and engagement because I'm a relationship oriented person and I feel mm. art should be a tool to enhance relationships but I think what happens uh, because I've run an art gallery before and I've learned this the hard way that uh, there is an approach that cities use to enhance arts activities by relating art as an object it's a painting it's a sculpture and therefore, the person who comes and looks at it, it's a consumption model. You offer something for a price, the price of your time, the price of drive, and you come and that uh, cost is met by looking at a sculpture. But I learned the hard way that in order to sustain art in the true sense, it has to be a tool to build relationships. And that's the consummation model. And that's uh, what rung true for me when you said, it has to be a space for enhancing expression and creativity. And that's another way of saying, is it a place where people can come and interact and have a safe space to interact with each other in order to build a relationship around what the city offers. So what the city offers becomes an object that bonds people and unifies and that requires conversation and interaction and so on. And so this is just, I don't have all the answers, but it's just an observation. I think where we go wrong when we sell anything, whether it's art, a painting, a sculpture, is that what we're trying to do is not just um, segregated to that object, but that it should lead to something community oriented. That's just a comment I have. I love that. Yeah. Beautifully said. Okay. Um, a question about money. Um, how yes. Does, what, so <laughs> say say we apply for some sort of a grant and it's for fifty dollars to do some sort of outcome what mm -hmm. would you say is a normal percentage that is required 
uh, for staff and, and resources around building a successful program for that? Um, that's a great question. And I actually probably wouldn't think of it in that way necessarily, because I think it's more about staff time. Um, and, uh, so I would, you know, may, okay, maybe you can say 10% or whatever, but I don't think it's a large percentage necessarily. Uh, but I think let's say, um, you know, I think about different public art programs and, and a, a funding mechanism in Vacaville likely has an opportunity to yield a decent amount of funding. Um, and, you know, you may need, um, you know, eventually I think you would, you would start out small and maybe just have a part-time staff member or a person that, you know, is supporting arts and events and, um, uh, arts events, Mel, help me if I'm forgetting something like public art programming and events. Um, and so that person, you know, they could start off part time and in, in the first, in the beginning of the, pro of the program or enhancing the program. Uh, and over time that, that might grow to a full-time staff member and then maybe two. And, you know, ideally they're not all funded out of a percent for art um or whatever the funding mechanism is um but i think that provides an opportunity where funding is tight to help pay for the staffing to support that um so i don't know that doesn't really answer your question necessarily wow. but <laughs> so then how thin are we staff wise to be able to support new projects that we want to try and do well fortunately um we are getting staffed up um, and we've got additional support with Kiana. Part of her job is to help us support art. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, and I would just also add that it, it varies greatly on the project, whether we're talking about a um, special event or a commissioned piece where you have an artist who's really doing the bulk of the work and maybe staff are working on a, a contract um, and you know ensuring that it's installed safely. But there's going to be a lot more legwork with putting together an event versus something um, like a, a piece that might be getting installed so so we can likely take on the first at least the first couple of projects without having to try and add staff to to the city staff is that right? we're going to do what we can and I, right? I think we can be selective with what you know what we can take on and we'll share that with you when it comes time yeah and and frankly the reason that we bring it up is not to like create more bureaucracy or burden, but is merely to ensure that everyone knows that like uh, we can't create a, a large scale public art program and <laughs> rely, you know, or expect Mel and Kiana to take that on as something that, you know, they already have full, like not full. Well, I don't know, Mel, you can say whether your plate is full or not, but relatively full plates. Um, so we can't, you know, create a new mandate without considering the fact that there do need to be people to support that. Um, so I know that you're already doing some, but it, it is like that if this grows into a larger scale program, that there would need to be some growth in um, support along the way. All right. If there are no oh, and I'm, I, the last thing I'll say is that for, if for special projects, there's always opportunities to do like outside, you know, you can hire consultants. We do that kind of thing um, to help certain, you know, uh, public art selection processes and stuff like that. So there's plenty of ways to do that. And you have, um, you're in a good position, again, being in a region that has a lot of, you're not like the only game in town. There's other people that um, could help support some of this stuff. Thank you, Josh. Um, Chair, mm -hmm. there's another comments from the uh, committee, then I would ask you to open it up for public comment. Any other comments before I open it up? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, public comment on this item. Uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to share specifically in regards to the specific agenda item, item 6A? Seeing none. I will close public comment for this item. And is that it for Josh? That's it. Thank you, Josh. Josh, appreciate you joining us. All right. Thank you all.
Yeah, I look forward to hopefully seeing you all in person at Dia de los Muertos. Yay. Bye. Bye.